Welcome to the Rheumatology Highlights Report on Rheumatoid Arthritis, Non-Biologic Therapy, and Metrics. I'm Alan Gabowski, Professor of Medicine and Public Health of Weill Medical College of Cornell University and attending rheumatologist at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. This program, together with others, is designed to give you an overview of the highlights at the recent American College of Rheumatology annual scientific meeting. My topic is non-biologic therapy and metrics, so let's get right on into it. This, together with the other podcasts, will give you a very nice overview of the various topics of interest, together with the buzz at the meeting. The first abstract I'd like to cover is number 499 from Durr, called Efficacy and Safety of Methotrexate Starting Doses of 7.5 and 15 milligrams per week in active rheumatoid arthritis. For many of us, there is often no question about how to start methotrexate and what dose to start it in. Most of us tend to start at the higher doses of 15 to 20 milligrams a week because we're generally starting to use it in patients with more active disease. On the other hand, there are some of our colleagues who may be using it at a lower dose initially, but escalating at the same interval, the rationale being that one can get to an appropriate tolerated dose while having fewer adverse events and enhanced tolerability. So this study looks at 100 patients who had very active disease, DAS, 28, three variables of 5.1, who had not been on methotrexate, and they were divided into two groups, a starting dose of 7.5 milligrams per week, escalated by 2.5 milligrams every two weeks, or 5 milligrams a month, or 15 milligrams a week, escalated also 2.5 milligrams every two weeks, or 5 milligrams a month. The final doses reached were 19.3 milligrams, in the first group, 24.3 in the second. What one can see here is that there is no significant difference in disease activity and disease control at the end of 12 weeks. The HAC scores are identical. There is no difference in cytopenias, transaminitis, or pneumonitis. However, the group that was started at the lower dose and escalated by five milligrams a month, just as the higher dose was, appeared to have much less in the way of nausea, fatigue, um, diarrhea, and so on. So it turns out that starting methotrexate at a lower dose and then escalating results in better tolerability with comparable clinical control. The next abstract, number 353, is called the effective combination therapy in prednisolone on hemostatic markers in rheumatoid arthritis. And the objectives of this study were to look at whether rheumatoid arthritis should be considered a prothrombotic state. They looked at 22 patients with early rheumatoid arthritis who were randomized to either a COBRA or what they called COBRA tight regimen, which was one half the dose of prednisone received in COBRA which you'll remember was a declining dose down to 10 milligrams a week, and no sulfasalazine. They looked at the pro time, the activated partial thromboplastin time, and other markers measured at 1, 4, and 26 weeks. The baseline characteristics were identical. Remember, this is a small cohort of only 11 patients in each group. At the end of the study, they found no difference in markers except for a stronger decrease in activated partial thromboplastin time after two weeks in the COBRA group. However, this was no longer seen at four weeks in that group as compared to the other. There were similar magnitudes of decline in the DAS44, CRP, and SED rate in both groups. So the authors conclude that while there were no changes in thrombotic markers with either regimen, it may be possible to start patients out with even a lower prednisone dose earlier in the course if one is looking to start out with a COBRA-like regimen that is escalation of non-biologic DMARDs 
in the early phases of disease. The next abstract, number 354, looks at the onset of hepatitis or neutropenia in patients with rheumatoid arthritis treated with combination therapy of methotrexate and leflutamide. Now, this is not a regular combination in the United States, but it is occasionally used, particularly in patients who, for one reason or another, cannot take or tolerate biologic therapy. This was a retrospective chart review of 144 patients on fixed-dose methotrexate and 20 milligrams of leflutamide for at least six months. What they found was the overall incidence of hepatitis was 19%, with several patients, many patients, having a delayed onset after 6, 12, and 24 months, respectively. The overall incidence of neutropenia was 6%, and a significant number of patients also had a delayed onset of neutropenia after 6, 12, and 24 months, respectively. The authors conclude that hepatitis and neutropenia may occur early or may occur later in patients on the combination of methotrexate and leflutamide. Consequently, vigilant monitoring is appropriate in patients on this combination throughout the course of their regimen. I'm not sure this is an observation that is at all novel, except perhaps to come up with some crude incidence rates for hepatitis and neutropenia in patients receiving that combination. The next abstract I'd like to look at is abstract 1287 by Dr. O'Dell, methotrexate inadequate responders and rheumatoid arthritis, triple therapy versus TNF inhibition with crossover in non-responders. There has always been a question about the triple therapy data versus the add-on TNF inhibitor data in methotrexate and adequate responders in terms of how and to what extent the three major parameters of efficacy is achieved. In other words, it does appear clear that both regimens will improve signs and symptoms. It does appear clear that both regimens will improve patient report outcomes. But there has been a question as to the extent of inhibition of structural progression as compared between these two regimens. So Dr. O'Dell did an interesting experiment by taking 353 active rheumatoids with a DAS-28 of 5.8 and a duration of 5.2 years and establishing that they were methotrexate inadequate responders and randomized to add either sulfasalazine and hydroxychloroquine, the so-called triple therapy combination, or they were added etanercept on top of their methotrexate. If the DAS-28 had not improved by at least 1.2 at the end of 24 weeks, they were switched from the strategy they were on to the alternate strategy, and the primary endpoint was the DAS-28 at week 48 by the original group, as well as x-rays. The switch rate turned out to be about 27% for both groups. However, at week 48, the change in the DAS was minus 2.1 for the triple therapy group versus minus 2.3 for the group that had etanercept added. So in other words, there was improvement after the switch in both groups of similar magnitude. What is interesting, however, was that there was a significant difference in the x-ray progression in the group on triple therapy versus the group that had etanercept added. In other words, the group that had etanercept added only showed a progression of 0.23 sharp scores at 48 weeks, whereas the group that received triple therapy had 0.87 and this was statistically significant. So the conclusion is that both strategies can achieve success, but there is a group of patients in which addition of a biologic, in this case, etanercept, to methotrexate in methotrexate inadequate responders appeared to be better 
in terms of achieving a better outcome in terms of inhibition of structural progression. Now, there has been much discussion in the literature about the treat-to-target strategy. And the fundamental application of the treat-to-target strategy is simply whatever it is that you're using plus a metric. So standard of care plus a metric appears to be better than standard of care alone. And the metric could be a patient reported outcome like the RAPID-3 or a physician defined outcome like the C dye. The point is that whatever outcome is being used is less important so long as it's guiding therapy to a particular target. Well, we know from the treat to target strategy, and we know from all the evidence on treat to target, that the fundamental theorem of measurement with a strategy is better than a strategy alone. This group, Urata and colleagues, asked the question, well, what about if we treat to two targets? If we used aggressive initial therapy, but looked at two targets? So this was a cohort of patients that were treated to multiple targets for a period of time extending over one year. A routine care group, a DASH-28 target of less than 2.6 target group, a group that in which matrix metalloproteinase 3 was measured, and a twin group with a DASH less than 2.6 and MM3 uh, reducing was looked at. So for 56 weeks, all patients were treated to both standards. At two years, there was better outcome in the early aggressive therapy group, as can be seen on the uh, four graphs shown to the right, but there appeared to be no difference in radiographic outcome. So there is a conundrum here as to whether routine care may not achieve the same clinical improvement, but may achieve the same improvement in structural progression. And I think that this is something that's going to be looked at much more carefully, particularly if one looks at this abstract concurrently with Dr. O'Dell's abstract, which I've just reviewed. There is no question, however, that a delay in optimal therapy may result in less better outcomes. So the approach to the patient with early rheumatoid arthritis is optimally achieved with a strategy, whether it is triple therapy or whether it is escalation of methotrexate followed by addition of a biologic agent, plus a metric. And again, it doesn't matter whether that metric is a patient reported outcomes metric or a physician-defined metric. So there appears to be better outcomes and optimal outcomes with the strategy and a metric than the metric alone. As to whether that appears to be true when multiple targets are chosen, as to whether that appears to be true for all domains of efficacy remains to be seen. Well, I hope you found this brief review of several significant abstracts that were presented at the ACR 2012 of interest. There is a post-test for you to take for your CME credit, and I encourage you to listen to the other podcasts in this series as well to get the broadest possible overview of the meeting, whether you attended it or whether you didn't attend it, because there was so much information presented that I suspect that even if you did attend, much of the information being reviewed in this presentation and by my colleagues may be material that is new or perhaps a review with a different focus. This is Alan Gabowski from the Hospital for Special Surgery, thanking you once again for your participation in this series.